gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce um, Dr. Crystal Pollitt. Um, who's, you know, the, the, the themes prevent transmission, aerosol controls, and practical solutions. Um, I was on a um, presentation or webinar or a meeting with presentations some time ago, and, and I saw Dr. Pollitt present, and I, I thought, what great practical information that would be really good to share through um, through OCO. And so, um, uh, and, and, and Dr. Pollitt's um, got a very interesting um, bio. Um, you know, she actually is based in Toronto. She lives in Toronto, but her, um, her professor work is through Yale. Um, she has a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Toronto and a Master's of Science in Chemical Engineering and Aerosol Chemistry through the University of, uh, of Toronto as well. And she also has a PhD in Environmental Toxicology from King's College, um, London, um, University of London. Um, and she's done postdoctoral research. She's been a postdoctoral research fellow in chemical engineering and applied chemistry at the University of Toronto. Um, um, and she's been a, an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts. And now she's uh, an assistant professor at Yale. Uh, she does most of her research in the past has been um, exploring the human exposome through characterization of environmental and biological samples using analytical and mass spectrometry. Um, to measure complex mixtures of trace elements and organic compounds. Um, she has applied these exposure assessments and methods in numerous epidemiological studies. And um, when you look closely at uh, Dr. Pollitt's research, there's a really interesting novel wristband um, air sampler um, that she's, she's, she's using um, as part of the characterization work. And I also, it's very interesting that um, she's done work um, looking at um, um, exposures, biomass exposure assessment in India, and I guess with our, um, you know, close involvement with Workplace Health Without Borders, there's a lot of synergy there. Uh, but the, just going back to uh, COVID, uh, when um, Dr. Pollitt presented, um, she talked about an airborne transmission risk estimator, which looks like a, an amazing tool. It's applied to schools or college, colleges, but I think this could be kind of transferable or translatable to whether to other um, work environments anyway so i just really want to thank uh, dr pollitt so much for presenting and i'll hand you over to uh, to crystal thank you thanks so much uh kevin for for that um so we're gonna build upon all of the the rates that we're seeing and now start talking about actual tools that we can implement and so um, implement for low cost or no cost. And that's really been a big motivating factor through this entire pandemic is how can we go to workplaces, to schools, to arts organizations that don't necessarily have the budget to, to revamp or install a whole HVAC system, but work with what you have uh, to, to get at uh, the most relevant routes of transmission. So I'll, I'll start there. Um, and and just go through what we know and what we've learned so much over the past 18 months about routes of transmission and relevant routes. So we know that ballistic droplets, so if someone is coughing, sneezing, you're going to have very large droplets that are being projected um, onto um, someone, especially if you are in close range. So this is where we start thinking about how can we specifically address these droplets. We've learned so much about the relevance also of aerosols and airborne transmission. Uh, and getting that to be noted as uh, a relevant route of transmission over the last 18 months. So we know that we release aerosols when we speak, when we sing, when we're coughing, sneezing, but also when we're breathing, playing an instrument. Uh, so understanding the dynamics of those aerosols is incredibly important, and it's by no means a new area. This is work that, um, as Kevin mentioned, that I've been studying since my, my undergraduate days and, and graduate school. Um, and being very widely um, investigated in the aerosol community. So we know how they behave. So we can now start to apply very targeted um, interventions um, and control measures to address these, these pathways. And from the very beginning, we realized that surfaces are important, 
um, and as we studied them more to be less important in terms of um, routes of transmission. So we know that with all of these different ways, we have to start thinking about infection control strategies that address each one of these routes of transmission. So we can use um, approaches, as was mentioned before, so well-fitting masks that apply for source control, um, as well as distancing as well, that leads that you don't have that proximal contact. Um, then getting onto the aerosol transmission, really looking at ways that we can uh, leverage outdoors the dilution that that presents ventilation in enclosed indoor environments, as well as filtration of that air. And then finally, the effectiveness of good hand hygiene and surface cleaning and disinfection. But the key with all of this here is that we have layered multiple control and prevention strategies that we can address all the routes of transmission, increasing the safety um, of our environment. And early on in the pandemic, we, we developed this um, dual pyramid um, uh, way of looking at it and presenting it um, to the different groups that we've been working with in terms of hierarchies of control measures. And what we started off with was this is very small pyramid at the bottom saying that we have personal behaviors that are ultimately going to shape an individual's level of risk. And that comes down to effective uses of masking and physical distancing, hand washing, surface cleaning. That is also balanced then on what are then the administrative type of controls that are going into um, an environment where someone will be interacting. So ultimately, we know that elimination, we can have lockdowns, but we know those are so severe um, in different ways. Um, and then thinking about different administrative controls that can be used um, in different environments, and then also engineering controls that we can then start to apply. And a lot of my work has been focused on how can we better understand different engineering controls, especially in the indoor space and in the indoor air quality when it comes to aerosol or airborne transmission um, to leverage the different um, strategies that can lead to decreased transmission risk. So we have been working with um, a number of different schools um, across the US. So I've been very fortunate to be working um, with the Dean of the School of Public Health, Dr. Sten Vermont, who um, is uh, a pediatrician and um, infectious disease epidemiologist that we can take team and, and really uh, share our um, control strategies that we recommend um, to these different environments. And that's him right over here. So we've been in lots of different schools looking at different um, lower no cost solutions that we can Im implement, um, as well as working extensively with arts organizations where budget is limited and we can start to think about creative ways that we can limit um, transmission. So what I'll um, go through today is um, ways that we can think about what is the risk? So how can we evaluate the risk within the space? Strategies that we can use to increase the amount of ventilation and filtration, strategies that we can then monitor the amount of ventilation, and then also what Kevin hinted about earlier are different monitoring strategies that we can actually use to be measuring SARS-CoV-2 um, within the air using some wearable technologies that I've been um, fortunate to, um, to develop over the last 18 months. So I'll start over here with risk assessment. Um, and I want to just get you thinking about how can we think about the risk within an indoor space and just break it down into the setting that you're in um, and the type of uh, room that, that you're in. And um, thinking about the different characteristics of that space that might make it less or more safe than the amount of air coming through. So every space that I walk into, I'm thinking of it as a, as a box model, um, how uh, wide, tall, what are the dimensions, and then the amount of air that's introduced um, and also leaving that space. So let's say we have a room that is 10 foot tall, 10 foot wide, 10 foot wide for simplicity, and we have 100 cubic feet per minute of air entering in that space. We can now think about how many times air or aerosols within that space are going to stay there and how frequently that's exchanged. And that's going to be a key parameter that we refer to as an air change per hour, or ACH, um, that will guide um, really what the level of ventilation was in, in that space. So if we have this mock space that's 10 by 10 by 10, 100 cubic feet per minute going in, we will have then six air changes per hour. There's been a lot of work uh, over the past 18 months thinking about how much ventilation is enough uh, and breaking it down then into how many air changes should your space have to make it um, effectively ventilated. 
So air changes um, on the order of six are considered to be ideal for a space. This will obviously depend on what you're doing in the space. Are people able to have other layers um, intervention strategies? So are they wearing masks? Are they distanced? Um, what are the other controls? Um, or as you move then down the list with lowering numbers of air changes, we get into less ideal levels. So going all the way down to less than three air changes per hour, which is characteristic of many spaces, um, is on much the lower end that we want to try to avoid. I've been listed here what the airflow is, so you can see the range of different levels that would come into this model space that I've suggested. You can go all the way from less than 50 um, cubic feet um, per minute to 100. That will then take you into your, your gradients of different air changes. And then I'll introduce in a moment just ways that we can then um, address and increase the amount of ventilation. So, for example, a portable air cleaner that you can buy from your local hardware store or Amazon um, will allow you to increase um, the amount of ventilation within this um, type of box space um, to get to ideal levels. So there's lots of different um, ventilation options. This was a very nice figure um, from a, a manuscript that I worked on with a number of other aerosol scientists um, across the U.S. where um, this was one example where they were looking at uh, classrooms and the amount of air changes in different classroom spaces de um, dependent on the type of ventilation that was available. So classrooms that had uh, closed doors and windows had very poor air changes, so less than three air changes per hour. But as you started to add mechanical ventilation, so HVAC systems, opening doors and windows, you then uh, were able to then progress into classroom spaces that had ideal levels of air change, so above six air changes per hour. So as, as Kevin mentioned, uh, I'd be really keen to develop tools that people can use in a very um, simple format to then evaluate what is the level of risk that's posed in terms of transmission based um, on, on airborne um, routes that you can plug into and then evaluate your level of risk? So this is the, a model that we developed based on a Wells-Riley model um, that's being used heavily within the past to, to consider airborne um, risk of transmission, where you can consider a number of people within a space that are infected and then what the risk of infection would then be um, to other individuals within that space. Uh, so within this model, we've um, been able to consider the amount of ventilation within the space. So do you have an HVAC system? What is the level of filtration you have in there? Are people wearing masks? Um, and what are the activities that they're doing within the space here? So within here, we're also able to consider what is the amount of inactivation we have, the transmissibility, the amount of settling based on size um, within here. We put that all into um, a Google Sheets um, Excel spreadsheet. I'd be more than happy to, to share this with anyone that is of interest, where we're then able to um, look at the amount of risk for the specific characteristics of an indoor space. So I originally developed this for the Yale School of Music that very early on were concerned about how their students would be able to resume practice and performances. And we applied this to every room used within the Yale School of Music to optimize air infection control procedures. So very briefly, I'll, I'll run through the different characteristics. We're able to um, apply the specific dimensions within the room, the different ventilation control strategies, if there's um, an HVAC system or without, um, input the amounts of um, people and people that we believe to be, uh, might be infected within the space. Uh, and also uh, adds if there are any uh, infection control strategies um, that are being used, so notably masking. Um, if people are masked or not within the space, that will relate to, to transmission. And further, we can look at um, who's at risk for transmission, um, the length of time that they spend within the space, and then also um, if there's any uh, ability to have some flush periods in there. We then are able to uh, output uh, what the risk of infection is, and also the amount of ventilation that's provided within that space. So you can then play around with supplemental um, options uh, within that, that setting here. So here's an example of how we can then add um, different types of air cleaners or box fans or opening windows to then play around with how much that's going to change the risk of infection within that space. Here's an example of some of these results that we can get um, from this model. Where we can look at the probability of infection within a space and then look at 
how is that rate of infection changing if we start to uh, play around with supplemental um, ventilation options. So if we have a space that has an HVAC system, mechanical ventilation only um, with this, this black line here, we can then add uh, a box fan, so a portable air cleaner, and we can see that that's effectively going to then reduce the amount of transmission risk there. So I'd be more than happy to share this tool and you can play around with it. And I'd have, be happy to answer any questions if you would like to use it. So next I'll, I'll briefly go into some strategies. So how do you know which strategy to use? Um, we've also worked um, to develop this, this flow chart of different engineering controls. Um, that you can apply to your space. And, and one of the, the challenges in thinking about how you can control and increase ventilation in your space is that every space is so different. Um, some spaces have uh, the luxury of having mechanical ventilation, so a uh, an HVAC system, while others don't. And the types of controls that you would then use within those spaces is going to be different. We incorporated this, um, this flow chart within the Ontario Science um, COVID tables um, uh, schools operation for this September um, as a guide for um, school administrators to, to help decide different ventilation options for, for their school spaces. Um, so within here, we're able to then uh, look at uh, in the light blue spaces that have mechanical ventilation and then in the blue um, spaces that are naturally ventilated. I'll just highlight here some of the examples from natural ventilated spaces so we can think about if it's possible to open windows if it's not, then we can then go through a range of different other procedures, um, such as use of portable air cleaners to enhance um, ventilation. So some of these uh, low cost, no cost strategies that I mentioned before are as simple as opening a window. Uh, so this is a really nice comparison of looking at what are levels of, of aerosols, or in this case here, carbon dioxide, um, if we have windows opened or closed. Um, so starting at um, a high level, if we close the windows, there'll be some natural decay. But as soon as we open those windows, it's an incredibly effective means of uh, enhancing ventilation within a space. Similarly, we can buy a $20 box fan and uh, apply a huge amount of ventilation um, into the space. So here we've recommended to um, schools, very organizations to put a, a box fan that you can buy from your local hardware store and exhaust it outdoors. So you're pulling air from the indoor space out. These fans operate at 1,000 to 2,000 cubic feet per minute, huge volume of air being drawn out of that space there for a very low amount um, of money. And then finally, there's also um, air cleaners that are available. Um, and become very popular and recommended uses in a number of different um, indoor spaces from commercially available devices um, and also DIY um, uh, uh, air cleaners that can be constructed as well. And this is as simple as, again, buying that $20 box fan and then just taping uh, an air filter onto the front of it. So taping um, a HEPA filter or a MERV 13 rated filter um, we found that just even using um, some duct tape to make sure you have a, a very clean seal around the edge um, is, is a good way of setting up these devices. And most importantly, they're effective. Uh, so this is a, a very nice um, summary of how their effectiveness um, works. Uh, along the, the y-axis here is we have the number concentration of, of particles being measured, so the number of them that are in the air. Uh, and then on the, the x-axis, we have time. So this blue one here shows that if you have a high level of, of particles and you have your doors closed, or even if you start to open them, you don't have a lot of change within those levels there, um, depending on the amount of winds that's blowing through. But as soon as you, with the red line here, um, turn on one of these air cleaners and you're starting to move air through a filter, you see this rapid decline. Um, so being able to assemble something like this for under $50 um, from your local hardware store is um, being recommended to many places and deemed to be effective. And just some Victorian science, um, you can see that when they're operated, strapping um, a filter onto a fan, you can see that black ring around where the fan was located here. Um, that's a nice just uh, demonstration visually that the particles are being captured and what's ever captured onto that filter is no longer being circulated and then um, acting as a risk. So we can also look at some of the uh, mechanical ventilation spaces here. 
Um, I will share my slides and I'll just go through this very briefly. Um, within an HVAC system, there's a number of different um, measures that can be implemented to um, optimize or increase the ventilation, um, such as increasing the amount of air to a space, ensuring that you have good filtration um, within the, the system as well, and then also increasing the amount of air changes, so how much flow is being operated to each one of those spaces um, with those air changes power that I previously uh, mentioned. So I'm just going to skip through some of these slides here and then just mention some ways that we can um, monitor how well our ventilation systems are operating. Uh, so carbon dioxide is a fantastic way of giving some indication, so a proxy measure for the amount of ventilation within the space. Um, carbon dioxide sensors can be purchased off of Amazon or, or other real retailers for about $100, $150 Canadian. Um, and they can be mounted around the same height as a thermostat and then give um, a good indication for, for how levels are varying based on the occupancy within a room. So we can color code that um, based on the concentrations that are being read. Normal outdoor levels are at sit about 400 parts per million or PPM. And then as you go higher, you can then rank that in terms of the amount of ventilation that is required. So this is being used um, in, in lots of different visual tools. I really like this example here from, from Tokyo where um, they have a color coded system and a readout to the audience of a performance to show what the level of ventilation is um, and very effective for um, consumer confidence within space. And then finally, I'll just wrap up by um, showing um, a novel strategy that um, we've been working on um, since the pandemic is a way that we can monitor someone's exposure directly to SARS-CoV-2. And this is using uh, a wearable clip. So I'm going to turn on my, you can see it over here. Um, but so you can attach to your lapel um, or on some sort of t shirts. Um, and we can use that as a means for collecting um, aerosols. We've used it in a number of different settings. Um, so this is just a highlight of some of the results where we've used it, um, working with restaurant servers, homeless shelter staff, healthcare workers, and just general community members. Um, so shown here on the, the bottom axis is the, the level um, RNA copies of SARS-CoV-2 that we've detected. Um, and you can see a range across the different occupations. Um, and most notably, what we found, what was incredibly interesting is Connecticut opened very early um, for indoor dining, and uh, we found the highest levels of exposure within um, this uh, occupational group. There's lots more resources um, that I've been working on and are available for your um, uh, download immediately, including different um, reopening guidance tools, but applicable to a much wider audience as well. Um, as well as a webinar series that I worked with a local um, uh, arts group with. Um, we've had about uh, 15 to 20 different webinars over the past um, 18 months that go through everything from ventilation to vaccination supports um, and also legal guidance um, for reopening venues and um, staff and patron um, occupancy and just a general aerosol FAQ with a number of other um, aerosol scientists. So I've listed my um, email address there as well as my um, Twitter feed uh, if uh, you have any questions or like to follow updates of what I've been working on. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Pollard. Um, uh, so uh, I just want to say that um, when I saw Dr. Pollitt's presentation, it really piqued my interest in um, a do-it-yourself, you know, air purifier. And I did end up buying a box fan and the filters, and I did make a, a box fan filter and donated it to my uh, son's school this morning, actually. Um, so I just, if it's okay, I might sort of read some questions outside of the, from the chat box, just related on to what you, um, you spoke about. Um, so, you know, there's some recently the, the ACGH and ASHRAE have backed off their air changes per hour, hour recommendations. The former says, however, excessive air velocities can result in the reduction of settling coefficients as a removal mechanism. Thus, the increase in air changes per hour in dilution ventilation airflow arrangement can result in an increase both at the time that the particle remain airborne 
and that the distance that the particles travel from the source. Um, have you got any thoughts on this, or have you? Uh, is this something that you might have looked at, um, Crystal? Yeah, I, I think everything um, that's being recommended needs to be done um, for the space specifically in mind and the people that are within the space. Uh, so, so yes, excessive air movements is is not something that we are looking for, but we are looking for a sufficient amount of air movements because we know that's going to be necessary. Um, and as I showed with those um, California classrooms, um, many places that are just relying on natural ventilation or have poorly commissioned um, or functioning HVAC systems, if you have an air change that is less than one in many places, we know that that's not an effective means for um, moving air through a space. But if you're pushing up at an excessive number of airflow, then then yes, that's also going to create some issues. So it's it's a point of balance and really understanding um, the space that you're in um, and applying these layers um, control strategies so that you can have um, a balance and not just rely on one and really push it to the extreme beyond you have um, effectiveness. Okay, thank you. Um, so the second question is. Um... It's, it's, it's about the level of risk. Um, so what is what level of risk is considered to be tolerable? And does that depend on an individual susceptibility or ability to choose um, to choose themselves? And I mean, it's all about relative risk. It's about reducing risk too. just to add that to that question. Oh, the conversations that we had on this topic um, when we were developing these risk models um, at, at Yale. Uh, and thinking about what, what is enough. And, and yes, it's, you're spot on with saying that it really comes down to who is in the space, how susceptible are they, um, and taking that into your consideration. So it's all also then this relative balance. So how much can you reduce it? And if you get to say a 5% level of risk, is that sufficient if you're in the space for a shorter amount of time? So there is, there's no easy answer on that, um, but, the most important for me was understanding where you're starting off and what is going to be the level of risk for people within that space there and then how could you then apply effective means for reducing that for relative risk right um and i actually uh, was sneaking i popped a question in for myself in another chat box too um it has to do with um air purifiers um with ionizers in them and you know if you read the literature the you know you you can generate ozone I'm just wondering if you wanted to add anything to any concerns about using air purifiers with ionizers from your experience. That's um that's such an important point, and um I I didn't go into to detail about that, but but yes, huge um, issue of the unregulated markets of air cleaners, and the use of different chemical technologies. Uh, for removal or claimed removal of of aerosol or infectious aerosol is incredibly concerning. Uh, so use of any type of ionizers, um, bipolar um, devices, there's so many different names that uh, they've been called um, as they try to circumnavigate <laughs> uh, the claims for um, for not being used. So my, my preference and recommendation is always to use mechanical um, filtration systems. So as I showed you that very nice picture of you have air that is you see on that filter there, those are the systems that um, will have effective use. Um, using any type of activated carbon for removal of different gas phase compounds, we know um, for other types of exposures are also effective. Um, but any type of chemical means uh, for reduction of or inactivation of aerosols is, is concerning and um, is, is not recommended. Okay, thanks, um, Crystal. So the, the next one's from Neil McDermott. Should we exhaust or bring in fresh air in the room? Yeah, this is um, a really important, important point as well. And I will share the, the flow diagram. Um, that I, I showed in the presentation, and that is really highlighting the, the balance points of, of operating a, an HVAC system. So we want to increase the amount of fresh air that is being supplied to a space, um, but there is a means, especially in Canada, as we're going into these winter months, 
of how much uh, fresh air, outdoor air is feasible to introduce into a space um, for, for heating requirements. So at that point, we're then uh, recirculating air within that space, and that's where we get into use of different um, filtrations within the air handling units for making sure that's optimized for either a HEPA or um, the highest grade MER filter that, that can be used accommodated um, by that, that space. So it's, it's a balance point for what's feasible with um, meteorological conditions outdoors. Okay, thank you. Um, so just going to, so that there's, um, uh, oh, I think this is from, I think this could be from, no, it's not from, from like, has the model been upgraded or changed re-delta? Like, have you factored delta into the, the work, the model? Yeah, so, so that was a, an easy update um, where we can then look at um, the percent increased infectivity from different variants. Um, and then that would then just be a global change within the um, transmission rates that, um, that can be used or modified. Okay, thanks. And uh, the, the last one from Masood um, Ahmed, are the air changes prayer recommended for fresh air, outdoor air, or a mixture of fresh air and remixed air? There are so many nuances in how you calculate air change. And yes, that is an important one to bring up. So that is the amount of fresh air. Um, as we're talking about recirculated air, we could then look at um, the percent effectiveness of, uh, of a filter um, and incorporate that into uh, the air changes. But yes, just for simplicity, I just, I just listed it as the total in versus out, assuming that it was all on um, fresh air intake. So on that note, um, I just want to refer to a comment from Sonia, who's a colleague of mine um, at OCAV, and she says, absolutely phenomenal speaker and scientist. Thank you, the visuals are fantastic. So, so thanks, Dr. Pollitt, for your presentation. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak um, and having me. I'd be happy to answer any more questions um, and share the slides um, that I presented.